This module is called Irrigation Scheduling, prepared by Stacia Davis and Sam Dodla, both from the LSU Ag Center, and presented by Stacia Davis. When we talk about irrigation scheduling, we're referring to the frequency or when irrigation should be applied, as well as the quantity or how much irrigation should be applied. Both of those things should be calculated um, every time that you want to apply irrigation so that you are as efficient as possible with our natural resources. The benefits to scheduling irrigation are very plentiful, but uh, just the few major ones include optimizing your crop yields because crops can suffer from too much or too little irrigation. Um, you have the best management practices um, of using our available water resources. You're also minimizing soil and nutrient losses from runoff or leaching, and you're trying to maintain the best possible soil health, um, which is very important to maintaining a good crop yield over many years. So when we talk about irrigation scheduling, there's a number of things that go into that. Four of the major things that we will need to discuss include the soil type, the crop type that you're going to be irrigating, your land management practices, as well as the climatic factors of how to adjust for uh, the weather conditions to apply irrigation. First, we're going to talk about the soil type. The soil is defined by two terms. One is the soil texture, the other is the soil structure. Uh, when we talk about soil texture, we are talking about the percentage of sand, silt, and clay that makes up that soil. When you hear people talk about a light soil, I'm on a light soil, or I have a heavy soil, or my heavy ground, um, that's usually referring to the amount of clay within that soil. So a heavier soil is going to have a high clay content, um, and so it acts more mucky and heavier than something with sand, which is considered a very light soil. And you can have anything in between those two ranges. Um, you can also have multiple textures layered within a soil um, vertically below the soil surface. And when that happens, there are special considerations when considering irrigation. Uh, but we are going to focus on a uniform, homogeneous soil texture um, when we talk about irrigation scheduling today. Um, your ranges of soil moisture, so when we talk about a percentage or a volumetric water content um, that is based on a soil texture, um, it will be higher for a clay soil than for a sand. So a field capacity or the maximum amount of water you can hold for a sand could be 13% or it could be 45% for a clay. It's very soil dependent. This is an example of a soil texture triangle provided by NRCS. This is something that we pulled directly off a website online and can be found easily by searching for a soil texture triangle. Um, this is how you would determine the general classification of your soil based on the percentage of sand, silt, and clay. So as an example here, we're going to see that a clay loam has about 35% clay, about 35% silt, and about 30% sand. If you line all those lines up, it'll fall within the clay loam box. And so if you knew your percentages, you can actually fit into a box and be able to classify your soil type and then determine how much water that can hold based on that soil type. The soil structure is the arrangement of those soil particles with pore space, and that will determine the physical properties of the soil. So here we have an example of sand, silt, and clay. Each one, um, this is a very exaggerated example, but you can see the difference in the particle sizes. The brown is the soil particles. Sand particles are much larger than clay particles, typically. Um, so it falls in between. Each soil is made up of air, the actual particle itself, 
and the water, which in these three, the water is pretty much bound to those soil particles because there's so little water and so much pore space. Your pore space is going to be what holds your water. So when you have larger pore spaces, you're going to hold less water. So in the sand, you're going to hold less water than in the clay where the water can be held to um, those pore spaces more easily. The soil structure helps to determine how much water that soil can hold. And so when you have all water and no air space whatsoever, you're at saturation, which is the example on the left. In that example, there's so much water in that soil that you likely have ponded or flooded conditions on the surface and uh, water will drain naturally below the profile that, that is considered beneficial to the plant or the root zone. And so when you have drainage in these situations, that water is excess and not beneficial to the plant. And so when we talk about irrigation, we typically only want to irrigate to field capacity. Field capacity is the maximum amount of water that can be held in that soil without the drainage due to gravity. And so every time we flood irrigate, we are over irrigating to get enough water into the soil to get to field capacity. Wilting point, or also called permanent wilting point, is the opposite of field capacity. It is the least amount of water possible in that soil um, that can be removed. When you get to permanent wilting point, that plant can no longer access any of the water in the soil. It's kind of like a sponge. When you have a very wet sponge and you wring it out, um, that sponge may not be dripping with water anymore and you may have gotten most of the water out, but it won't be fully dry unless it's actually dried. The water evaporates later or um, some other way or extra energy added to that sponge to remove the water. Permanent wilting point is that residual amount of water in the soil. Now when we talk about irrigation, we typically talk about it in terms of inches. And um, it's hard to relate sometimes the soil profile, uh, looking at those soil particles, and a depth. So really, that relationship is if you remove the soil particles and you removed the airspace and allowed that water to enter a cup, then the amount in that cup is equal to a depth. And so saturation on the left would have more water in the cup because there's more water in the soil um, compared to wilting point, which would have very little water in that cup. And so you can choose these soil characteristics um, to help you determine irrigation need um, multiple different ways. One of the easiest, but also the most generalized way is to use overall averages or recommendations. And so in this example pulled from uh, Clemson Extension, uh, they have average plant available water, which is the difference between field capacity and permanent wilting point. That available water is in inches per foot. So if your roots grow three feet, then you will multiply that number by three and that's the amount of water that your soil can hold. Um, that is the maximum amount of water the soil can hold. Um, if you have compaction and your roots only really access water in the top 18 inches, then you would have to multiply it by one and a half feet. Um, and so that is very site specific. These are general averages. There's a lot of different types of soil out there. Um, this is better than not scheduling irrigation at all, but there are better ways to be more accurate and site specific. What you should notice is that as you move from sand or the light textured soils at the top down toward the bottom, your available water increases until you start adding clay. Clay actually, because the particles are so small, um, cannot hold as much water. They may have large amounts of water measured. So if you're using a small moisture sensor, the numbers are going to be higher. But the plant cannot pull the water out of the clay like it can the sand. And so your permanent wilting point is also much higher. 
And so you're basically shifting the available water up in the, uh, numbers wise. And so you're actually not storing as much water um, when you add the clay. Okay, a better way to determine your soil characteristics is to use web soil survey. This is still more of an averaged way of determining it, but this is more based on the actual site than um, using a general recommendation. And so this is what the web soil survey website looks like. We just navigated to that website there and you click on that green button that says start WSS. And um, I selected a field on my research station that I wanted to uh, look at. And so that is my area of interest with the turquoise box on the field there. And I navigated on the top to Soil Data Explorer and then also Soil Properties and Qualities. And on the left hand side, you can see a whole list of soil physical properties. And so this will tell me my available water capacity, my available water storage, my percent of sand, silt, and clay, um, my organic matter, all of these generalized things, but as site specific as possible um, for the soil types that it has determined in that box. So as my example, I'm gonna show you available water capacity. So on the left, we selected the top 30 centimeters. So from soil surface at zero to 30 centimeters below the surface, inside that box, we are one soil type, which is listed at the top there, the Latanier clay. The rating is the number that I was looking for. And so since I picked available water capacity, my rating is 0 0.17 centimeters per centimeter of available water capacity. If I am unsure what that term means, um, the great thing about this website is that they define it. And so this middle description section will actually tell you what that term means and how it should be used. And then it gives you as much information as possible um, about that number. Okay, so at another point, I also looked up the permanent wilting point at my site and that came in as 26.4%. And we just saw that the, my available water capacity is 0 0.17 centimeters per centimeter. That is also equivalent to 17%. So if my available water capacity is my field capacity minus permanent wilting point, then I can determine my field capacity by adding the 17% to my permanent wilting point number, which gives me 43.4% which is my field capacity for this location. You can also use lab measurements to determine um, your permanent wilting point and field capacity. This is gonna be something more like I would do as a researcher, um, where I'm gonna take a sample and measure it both gravimetrically and volumetrically and determine where those points are um, in the profile. Now there are two ways to talk about soil moisture. One is volumetric, which is what we've been basically talking about uh, that can be converted from inches to a percentage. It's all based on volume. Um, it's very translatable to rainfall and good for irrigation scheduling. Another way to um, talk about soil moisture is to talk about it gravimetrically. Um, and that is given in a tension term uh, which relates to pressure, and it has to do more with the amount of um, pressure or tension required to pull the water out of the soil by the plant. And there are benefits to measuring soil moisture gravimetrically as well as volumetrically. They both have pros and cons. The one great thing about gravimetric readings is that they are independent of the soil type at certain points of consideration. For example, saturation will always be zero. That means it requires the least amount of tension for that plant to pull that water because it is readily available. Field capacity falls between 10 and 30 centibars and that depends on how disturbed the soil is or how compacted the soil is. 
So an undisturbed soil is going to be closer to 30 centibars, whereas a soil that is frequently tilled um, or has been disturbed in some way would be more like 10 centibars. And that just has to do with the pore space and how that water is being held. Um, permanent wilting point is always considered 1500 centibars or 15 bars. Now, from our example, we determined that field capacity was 43.4% and permanent wilting point was 26.4%. That is for our example only. Those numbers would need to be estimated for every site that you were planning on scheduling irrigation. And so even though volumetric uh, values are easier to interpret, they're more difficult to obtain, uh, whereas gravimetric readings are uh, readily known, but difficult to relate to depth of rainfall or um, depth of evapotranspirative losses. And here's why there is a distinct relationship difference. So along the x-axis, we have those tension numbers. We're on the bottom, we're in bars. On the top, we're in centibars. And on the y-axis, we have available soil moisture, which is basically zero is dry and 100 is wet, basically permanent wilting point of field capacity. And you can see when we're wet at field capacity, every line on this graph, which represents different soil types, converge at 0.1 or 10 centibars as field capacity. So that is true for every soil. If you go to the other end of the graph and look at dry at the 0%, um, the lines actually go off the graph and the graph ends at 10 bars, which means we didn't even make it to 15 bars, but you can clearly see that all of those lines are converging on a single point um, outside of that graph area. But in between field capacity and permanent wilting point, the profile wets and dries very differently depending on that soil structure and texture. And so when you are at 50% depletion, which is a normal time to trigger irrigation, um, that would be at 50% available soil moisture on the y-axis. If you follow that line over, the first line you hit is loamy sand. And so if you deplete 50% of that soil profile, then you are going to irrigate uh, between 0.2 and 0.3 bars. But if you continue following over to the clay, 50% depletion actually corresponds to two bars. And so it is very different between those two limits based on the soil type. The final thing we're going to talk about with soil type is organic matter. Organic matter is very important to the soil system and for soil health, which is a very hot topic right now. Um, organic matter is primarily going to improve your soil structure which means you're going to increase your available water holding capacity. Um, when you do that, you also increase the amount of nutrients you're going to hold in the soil because nutrients can be mobile with water. Um, and you're also going to have more beneficial organisms that are going to help your plants grow better and be better, produce more. Um, you can also relate that to water quality when you are holding more nutrients, that means you're not leaching or having nutrients run off. It helps to buffer the pH. Um, and so overall, it's going to help the entire system. And that includes with irrigation. Now we're going to move to talking about the crop. So the crop is going to affect multiple things, like when do you need the irrigation? because that is based on when the crop is grown. If you grow the crop during the dry season, where most everywhere has a specific dry season, in Louisiana, where mostly July and August are dry in typical years. So if you grow a crop in the July and August months, then you are more likely going to need irrigation than if you don't. Um, it also helps you determine 
when you need to initiate as well as terminate irrigation based on those crop growth stages and when it needs water the most. Um, and it also helps to determine how deep the roots go as well as what depth the uh, plant can access water from. And so that's important in determining when you need to add more water through irrigation um, by knowing how much it can actually access. And so an example of water use by a cotton crop based on the crop stage is shown in that table below. That's why it's important to know which crop you're using and what stage you're at to know how much water needs to be applied. Okay, now let's talk about land management. So if you remember these pictures from earlier, we have the, the soil particles, air and water for the three different types of soils. This is an undisturbed soil. Now let's compact the soil. Basically all we did was scrunch those soil particles together. As a result, we have the same amount of water, but we have less air space, which means we have less storage for water overall. So compaction doesn't just affect how the roots grow, it also affects how water is stored, and when you're storing less, that means you have to irrigate more often. Tillage practices are very important to the soil structure and uh, we do not want to disturb this, the natural soil structure as much as possible. So when you remove tillage from a field, you're hoping to improve your irrigation water use by improving the soil structure. You should have higher organic matter, especially over time, um, and that it helps to incorporate cover crops into the no-till practice to build that organic matter over time. And you also have less evaporation losses. And that's illustrated in this picture. On the left is um, an undisturbed soil profile where um, the soil surface is very flat on the top. So only the top of those soil particles are interacting with the atmosphere. Whereas on the right hand side, that is a conventionally tilled field where the entire field was tilled and um, right before planting. And you can see that the atmosphere is interacting with more surface area of those particles, which means there's more ability for evaporation to occur. Um, when you increase evaporation, more water will move out of the profile that will need to be replaced um, over time. Now, the other side to this is that when you um, when you surface irrigate, for example, in Louisiana, we typically furrow irrigate most of our fields uh, that have irrigation, then any surface water application is going to naturally compact the soil. Additionally, rainfall, large amounts of rainfall can naturally compact the soil. Tractor movement can compact the soil. There's so many issues with our heavier soil types with compaction and um, and the way that we can work with the soil in our other processes that sometimes makes no-till practices um, a difficult option in Louisiana. Pairing that with cover crops, again, can build organic matter and help to alleviate that issue over time. Now let's talk about the climate. So water movement in the soil is driven by rainfall or irrigation that's entering the soil profile. And then there's also evaporation from the soil surface and transpiration where the plant takes up the moisture through the roots and transpires it through the leaves uh, during the hottest part of the day. In our purposes for scheduling irrigation, we're gonna combine the evaporation and transpiration terms into evapotranspiration. That is just an easier way to calculate it, but it's just those two processes in one. When we talk about evapotranspiration, there are four weather features that we need to discuss. One is relative humidity, one is temperature, one is solar radiation, and one is wind speed. Those four factors go into how much ET occurs. 
So hotter temperatures, uh, more sunlight, uh, high wind speeds will increase evaporation and transpiration and increase the overall water loss. So it's important to know even not just when it rains, but also your weather conditions that are contributing to the loss of water in that soil profile. This is an example of a plant with a very specific root structure um, in a basic soil. And we're going to draw a box around that, those roots. Any water that does not enter that box or moves through that box and doesn't stay in it is not beneficial to that plant. The plant can only access water within the box. And so if the box is completely full of water and soil particles, no air, we'd be at saturation. Field capacity is after drainage due to gravity. And permanent wilting point is much lower where there's a small amount of water, but the plant cannot actually pull it from the soil. So if you picture the box as our cup, those would be our limits to the soil moisture. Maximum allowable depletion, which is a flexible number uh, de dependent on what you're growing and how you're growing it. Um, that is somewhere in between field capacity and permanent wilting point. Maximum allowable depletion can also be considered your trigger point for irrigation. It's the maximum allowed uh, that you will allow to deplete before you want to irrigate. So from this box, we're going to evaporate out um, and transpire. We are going to accept rainfall into the soil. And we will also accept irrigation. And so these are just inputs and outputs to this box. Now, if any of those inputs or outputs generate surface runoff or depercolation, then that becomes a loss because it is moved outside of the box and we want to avoid that. This is called the soil water balance. If you keep track of these inputs and outputs within that box, you can estimate the soil moisture level within that soil. So let's talk about how we would estimate uh, these different uh, values. So first, let's talk about ET. When we estimate ET, we typically estimate it as reference evapotranspiration. That's pulling weather data and calculating ET for a reference crop that you can convert to your crop using a crop coefficient. And there are standards for doing that. So if you have a weather station, uh, we can help set you up so that you can calculate ETO for yourself and then how to convert it to your crop's ET. Every crop will have a different ET on the same day because of how it transpires. You can also use a local weather network that uh, could calculate reference ET for you. That makes it much easier. You don't have to calculate it on your own. You can also directly measure your crop ET using soil moisture sensors, plant sensors, or some sort of remote sensing or imagery. Uh, those are also good options as direct measurement. Effective rainfall is considered the amount of rainfall that can be stored within the root zone. And so there's a way to, you must find a good way to correlate between um, the rain gauge measurement, which is typically what you're going to see on the news or you're going to measure with your own rain gauge, and what the soil can hold. Another factor that's not really considered in this way of scheduling irrigation is whether your soil could actually accept the rain that fell. There are times in Louisiana with our sealing soils where we get a significant amount of rainfall and we have the storage space in the soil, but for whatever reason the water ran off the surface and did not have time to infiltrate. That's a very difficult thing to measure and that would be where a direct measurement would be more appropriate. In this example, we're going to assume that if we can store it, it was infiltrated. And so 
this example says that we can store three-fourths of an inch of water. So how much is effective for each, each event? So if we can store three-fourths inches, it doesn't matter whether we have one inch or two inch or 15 inches. We can only store three-fourths of an inch. So our effective rainfall would be three-fourths of an inch for any of those situations. Now the final um, scenario is 0.4 inches. Well, we can store 0.75, but we only got 0.4. So our effective rainfall would be 0.4 inches. And again, that's assuming that all of it infiltrated. Effective irrigation um, must be estimated similarly to rainfall. Um, you normally have a point of measurement where you can actually measure the amount of water that you're putting out as a volume. Uh, I like to use inline flow meters like you see in the picture on the right where um, we can measure the flow rate as well as the total volume of water applied. The depth of water would be that volume divided by the area that you irrigated. So if you put out a certain volume of water measured by the flow meter, then you would divide it by the number of acres that you irrigated and that would give you your depth. Another way to do it is through soil moisture. And so in the picture on, or the graph on the left, uh, these are, this is one location with five sensors at different depths from the soil surface. Uh, the first one at six inches below the surface, the last one at 36 inches. And the markings on the graph indicate an irrigation event. And so we can actually visualize how much of that water infiltrated based on the percentage jump um, per irrigation event. And so that can be directly related to the amount of irrigation applied. That was effective. So let's talk about how we're gonna use all this information to schedule irrigation. And I'm gonna run through it as an example. So we're going to calculate a soil water balance for a turf grass, just to make the numbers simple. We're gonna have field capacity at two inches. So we never wanna irrigate more or have more moisture in the soil greater than two inches because it will just drain due to gravity. Our permanent wilting point is a half an inch, uh, which means that we don't want to get anywhere close to half an inch of water or our plant will permanently wilt. Um, but that's a baseline that we need to know. So the amount of available water we have in the soil is the difference between field capacity and permanent wilting point which is two inches minus a half an inch. So we have an inch and a half of water to play with. Well, we're gonna set a maximum allowable depletion of 50%. And that's a typical number in turf grass applications. And so our readily available water, or the amount that we're gonna allow to deplete, is the maximum allowable depletion multiplied by the available water. So we would be 50% times 1.5 inches which is 0 0.75 inches. And so that's gonna become um, our trigger point. We are gonna allow three fourths of an inch to deplete and then we want to irrigate. And so to determine that refill point of when we have three fourths of an inch that has depleted, we just take the field capacity number and subtract the readily available water. And so when we are keeping track of the daily water level, when we get to 1.25 inches or below, we need to trigger an irrigation event immediately or the next day. So because I have a warm season turf grass, I selected a crop coefficient to translate my, my reference ET into my crop ET that was appropriate for Louisiana and that crop. Um, and my refill point is 1.25 inches. So my ending water level, so my the water level in the soil at the end of the day is equal to the water level at the start of the day minus any crop ET losses, but plus rain or irrigation that was effective. 
And so this is just a week of in August, and we're going to start our water level at two inches, which is field capacity. Um, I've calculated ETO to be 0 0.25 inches, which is my reference ET. I multiply that by my crop coefficient to get it for my specific turf grass, and that gives me 0 0.225 inches of crop ET. Rainfall and irrigation were not applied that day, and so my ending water level is equal to my starting water level, which is 2, minus ETC, which is 0 0.225, plus 0, plus 0 for rain and irrigation, and that gives me 1.775. That The ending water level is the starting water level for the next day, and so that number is moved down to the 2nd of August, and you just keep calculating that every day and adding ET or rain or irrigation when you need it and when you have it. So on August 3rd, we received some rainfall and it was all effective. And so you can see the soil moisture level um, in the ending water level column increased from the day before on that day because of that rainfall. Otherwise, it was dropping all week. And so now we get to August 6th, and um, we have gotten to an ending water level of 1.09. Well, that is below our refill point. And so now we need to trigger an irrigation event. And so on the next day, we are going to add irrigation, which was almost an inch. But we also lost ET that day at the same rate as previously. And so the final, the ending water level um, does not reach to because of that ETC that was removed because irrigation was calculated based on the previous day. And that's okay because in a humid climate such as Louisiana, we want to leave as much um, storage space as possible for rain to occur if it's going to. And so irrigating to uh, field capacity or even a little bit below field capacity is appropriate to allow storage for rainfall. Um, rainfall is always better than applying more water with irrigation. Thank you for listening to this module and if you have any questions or would like to follow up, please feel free to contact me um, at any time. Thank you.